Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4. I'm not going to remember every name. It's just not going to happen. All right, Ephesians chapter 4. Begin reading in verse 1. I, therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation wherewith you are called, with all lowliness and meekness, with long suffering, forbearing one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. <laughs> well, we're wasting our time preaching that in a Baptist church, aren't we? Amen. All right, verse 4. There is one body and one spirit, even as ye are called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all, and in you all, but unto every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. I want to preach this morning on one uh, of these examples that is given uh, baptism. Look in verse um, 5. It says one baptism. Now it says one baptism, but the title of my message this morning is different baptisms. And I'll explain throughout the message what we're talking about there. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for the chance to read and study your word. And I pray, dear God, that you unlock our understanding and enlighten our eyes to see the things that you have in your wonderful word, Lord. Thank you for preserving it for us without error so that we can hear from you. Thank you, God, that I heard from you today, unworthy though I am to do so. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. All right, I want to say this morning that baptizing or dipping into a substance is an important theme in the Bible. Yet it is largely misunderstood because people equate it with water. Baptism does not necessarily have anything to do with water. Now, it does in the case of water baptism, obviously. <laughs> But in other baptisms, it does not. Uh, uh, also, people equate it with salvation. It's not what saves you. And people equate it with supernatural gifts. And people get baptism all wrong, so we're going to run through and we're going to explain them. Now, it's a little bit heavy, and there's quite a bit of material, so if we end up going too long and I get hungry for soup, we'll just stop and pick up the rest of it at the 4 o'clock service, okay? Uh, different baptisms. Now, you are at Victory Baptist Church. We use the name Baptist because we believe the Baptist distinctives. By that, we mean salvation by grace alone. There's nothing you can do to earn salvation. You can't put some money in the offering plate this morning and get saved or stay saved or partially saved. It doesn't have anything to do with any work that you do. You can't join the right church and get saved. You can't run through a little uh, ritual and get saved. Salvation is 100% by grace through faith. Amen. Um, that's a Baptist distinctive. Another one is baptism by immersion. After somebody gets saved, and they're already saved, and that's already settled, to show that they're following the Lord Jesus Christ, we baptize them. And the, as you know, the word baptize comes from the Greek word that means to dip. So, therefore, we dip them. We do not just you know, splash a little water in their face or sprinkle them or pour water over them. Because uh, Jesus says when he was baptized, he says, coming up out of the water... Oh, okay, well, if he's coming up out of the water, then he got dipped in the water. So we believe in baptism by immersion. We believe in the individual priesthood of the believer. We don't go to a different priest to, you know, get uh, forgiveness of our sins. We go straight to Jesus. We are our own priest, so to speak. We can go straight to God. We don't have to stop at Mary or stop at John the Baptist or stop at grandmother and grandfather that's done gone on. home. We can go straight to God. Listen, did you know you can have a personal relationship with God? Amen. Today, I hope you did pray and you talk straight to Him. I hope you opened your Bible and He talked straight to you. Amen. You do not have to go through your pastor. You do not have to go through a real good Bible teacher. You do not have to go through Mother Teresa or whoever your you know favorite saint is. No, you can go straight to God. What a wonderful thing. Uh, preservation of the Bible. We believe the Bible is preserved and, and sitting on our lap. We believe we can talk to God. And I, I, I had him talk to me just today. Uh, we believe in eternal security. We believe that when God saves you, he just flat out saves you. Amen. We think uh, your past sins are forgiven and your future sins will not be uh, accounted to you. Uh, because, and we got scripture, of course, that clearly says that. 
We believe in the premillennial second coming of the Lord Jesus to come and set up his kingdom. We think he's literally going to come and set up his kingdom. We think all those Bible promises are true. Amen. We believe in the autonomy of a local church. We're, here at Victory Baptist Church, we're not under any other group. There's not some uh, board over us that could come and say, well, I don't like the way your pastor is doing something or the way your treasurer is doing something or the way your deacon is doing something or the way whatever. They're not over us. We're under God. That's who we answer to. And uh, somebody else isn't going isn't to tell this church what to do. We're an autonomous church. Now, we fellowship with other churches. We've got, we certainly consider ourselves friends with other Bible-believing Baptists. Don't get me wrong. But we're not under their authority. Uh, inspiration and preservation of the Bible, separation of church and state. You know what? The Baptists got tired of getting beat and put in jail. We got tired of the state telling us what we could do in church. We... We have always taught individual, civil, and religious freedom and separation of church and state where the state can't tell you what you can do in church. Now, that doesn't mean that individuals don't have religious freedom once they become part of our government. Our president should be a Christian, should Amen. Amen. Our senators and congressmen should be, senators, should be Christians, and they should at least, at the very least, have the freedom to decide whether or not to be a Christian. When you say they can't do that, when you say the kids can't say a prayer in school or over at the beginning of a football game or something, there's, that's not what we're talking about when we talk about separation church and state. That doesn't have anything to do with any church. Amen. You don't have to be a member of a church to pray. See? See the difference? Uh, separation of church and state is a Baptist distinctive and has been for a long time. But as much as we believe all those things, Baptists have historically put less emphasis on baptism than some Catholics or Protestants because we don't think baptism saves or even helps save. But we don't want to go to the other extreme and say that it's not important. Anything in the Bible is important. If the Lord told us to do something, we ought to do it, shouldn't we? Amen. So we're going to talk about that today, and we'll study it. And the way I'm going to categorize it is I'm going to look at Jewish baptism first. There was some baptism that was just for the Jews. Don't try to put, have some Gentile in Crossville, Tennessee in 2023 do these baptisms. That's not who it was for. That's not who he was talking about. That's not the context. Then we're going to look at Jesus' baptism. You know, Jesus had a baptism. And then we're going to look at Gentile baptism. And then we're going to look at baptism into the hell and the lake of fire after rejecting salvation. Now that's... Uh, that's a baptism that's talked about in the Bible. Yes, it is. And if we, uh, like I say, if we don't get through it all this morning, that's fine. We'll finish it up in the 4 o'clock service. All right, now let's look first of all at Jewish baptism. You say, now wait a minute, wait a minute, Bob. The, the text you read said there is one faith, one baptism. Well, amen. Paul is talking to some church-age saints, and so obviously he's talking about the baptism that he's talking about in that context. You say, well, that's confusing. It says one baptism, and you're telling me there's several baptisms. No, it's not. <laughs> you understand these things. We'll pick on David Gimrich here today. He just pops in front of my face first here. What if he tells his wife, Cherish, here, Cherish, you're my one and only love. There's a truth to that, isn't there? <clears throat> but if you're just trying to be funny and catch him in his words... Well, he also loves his mom and daddy, doesn't he? <laughs> well, he also loves his sons, doesn't he? Well, he also loves his home state, doesn't he? <laughs> doesn't he love Tennessee? He also loves uh, some of his close friends at his church and his co-workers. <laughs> I mean, he also loves a good steak, doesn't he? <laughs> I mean, what? He's not lying when he says, Cherish, you're my one and only love, but he's obviously talking in a certain context, but he loves other things. What if he tried to make all of those loves exactly the same? We couldn't even deal with the poor crazy guy. <laughs> what if he loved his son Ethan in the exact same way he loved a good steak? Ethan wouldn't have long to be here, would he? No more beatings on that poor boy. Wouldn't take long. <laughs> Listen, folks. You understand when he says one baptism, he means one baptism in the context of what I'm talking about right now. He doesn't mean there's never been a peanut dipped in chocolate. He's talking in, a, in this context, folks. We, we realize that, and we use that in common speech all the time. A lot of people correcting the Bible, 
are just trying to find something to yeah. pick about. Yeah. They understand these things. Yeah. All right, so let's look at the Jewish baptisms first. All right, the first one we'll look at is uh, in the Old Testament, the baptism unto Moses. Uh, we won't be preaching as much as we'll be teaching today. All right, 1 Corinthians chapter 10. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 1. Moreover, brethren, I would not that ye should be ignorant how that all our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea and were all baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea. All right, so what is this baptism? This is the children of Israel, God's chosen people, being led out of Egypt and into the promised land, and they were dipped into something. They were baptized into something. Who is the one doing the baptism here? God. Who is he baptizing? Israel. What is he baptizing them in? In the cloud and in the sea. Remember that cloud came down and, and would lead them? Remember the sea as they passed through the Red Sea? They went right through it. I mean, they were in it. Now, they weren't in it in the same sense as they would have been had he not parted the sea. <laughs> but they were very much in uh, the Red Sea. If, as they were walking through there, if anybody would have had a, you know, a GPS on tracking them, and said, all right, where are the children of Israel now? They said, well, they're at the bottom of the Red Sea. <laughs> they just weren't drowning. <laughs> all right, so that's baptism unto Moses. Now, during this time, we do have an interesting uh, exception. We have Naaman the Syrian. Remember when he had leprosy? And he had those spots on him. And he was went into the river and went under and came back up seven times, and when he did, his spots were gone. That's right. oh, yeah. And his yeah. flesh came like the flesh of a little child. And, I, and by the way, even while there was Jewish baptism going on, they had Gentile proselytes and Gentile friends and loved ones that would come and uh, adopt their faith of Judaism, and they took part in some of this. Sometimes they had servants and different people that were with them for one reason or another. It was primarily Jewish, but you had some Gentiles mixed in there. Just like now in the church age, it's primarily Gentile, but you've got some Jews that are saved and in churches with us, don't you? All right, so that's the first of the Jewish baptisms, is the baptism unto Moses. All right, the second uh, Jewish baptism is John's baptism. Let me see if I have this verse down here. Yes, I do. John chapter 1. When John the Baptist was talking about Jesus, and it was getting time for Jesus to begin his ministry... It says in John 1.31, And I knew him not, but that he should be made manifest to Israel. Therefore am I come baptizing with water. He doesn't say, therefore as a plan of salvation for somebody that's scared they're going to hell when they die, they ought to just come get my baptism and don't worry, you'll be saved. That's not what he says. That's not the context. That's not what's going on. He is saying, your Messiah is here, and I'm doing this to manifest Christ to Israel. You see, this is a Jewish baptism. Don't mix this up. Don't let somebody that has an imperfect understanding of their Bible, and I'm not picking on them, because God used some people in the book of Acts who had an imperfect understanding of their Bible and was still teaching John's baptism until Aquila and Priscilla came along and explained it to them more perfectly. Amen. So I'm not running them down. I'm just saying... They're babies. They're beginners. There's some things in the Word they don't understand yet. They may be very sincere. I'm not picking on them. But as you grow, learn that John's baptism is not to you. Amen. It was to manifest Christ to Israel. Who was doing the baptism? Well, it was John. He even baptized our Lord Jesus, didn't he? Amen. Right. Who is he baptizing? He's baptizing mainly Jews, but a few proselytes too. And he's baptizing them in the River Jordan. Reminds us of that situation with Naaman, doesn't it? All right, so here is John's baptism, dealing with Jews, manifesting Christ to Israel. Now, there's another baptism still in the New Testament that is completely Jewish. And I, I call this one Peter's baptism. Turn to Acts chapter 2. This is a famous passage when you're dealing with false doctrine on baptism. All right, Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2, verse 37. Now, when they heard this, 
they were pricked in their heart and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. All right, so this is Peter's baptism. He's still talking to Jews. He's still offering their Messiah to them. They're still worried about bringing in their kingdom. Do you notice something different about this baptism than when you were baptized in a Bible-believing Baptist church? They're being baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. What did we say when we baptize you in a Bible-believing Baptist church? We say it in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Why do we say it that way? And why is he saying Jesus Christ? I'll tell you why. Because, once again, he is manifesting Jesus Christ as the Messiah to the Jews. Amen. When Jesus told us to go and teach all nations, he said, not just Jews, all nations, he said, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Do you see the difference? Oh, yeah. When they're baptizing in the name of Jesus Christ, that's not you. Unless you're an Old Testament Jew trying to bring in your kingdom. When he says, baptize in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost, that's when the disciples go out and teach all nations. Do you see the difference? Furthermore, it's very obvious that he's just talking to Jews. Let's run through Acts chapter 2 and look at some of these words. Acts chapter 2, verse 1. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. The day of Pentecost, what's that? When's the last time you got a Pentecost present? <laughs> we don't celebrate Pentecost. That's a Jewish thing. All right, uh, look at uh, Acts chapter 2 and verse 5. And there were dwelling at Jerusalem. Where's that? Is that the capital of Tennessee? <laughs> uh, Jerusalem, that's over in Israel. And there were dwelling at Jerusalem, what? Jews. Devout men out of every nation under heaven. So we're dealing with Jews here. All right, look down at verse 22. Ye men of Israel. Do you see why I think he's talking to Israel? Is it because I just want to force my interpretation on it? Or am I showing you verses that actually say that? All right, look at verse 36. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly... You see what we're dealing with? We're dealing with a Jewish baptism. What were they concerned about here in early in the book of Acts? Look back at Acts chapter 1. Acts chapter 1, verse 6. When they realize the Lord Jesus is resurrected and he's coming back and seeing them, look at verse 6. When they therefore were come together, they asked of him, saying, Lord, wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? They're worried about that kingdom coming back. Amen. They're not saying, Lord, build us a big old church so we can have soup fellowships and youth activities and singings and all this stuff. No. They're saying, hey, what about our kingdom? I mean, the Babylonians came and took the southern kingdom and the Assyrians came and took the northern kingdom and we haven't had a kingdom in Israel that's had anything since the days of uh, David and Solomon and th those kings that descended from them. And God, what, when is this stuff... When are you going to bring back this kingdom? That's what they're concerned with in Acts chapter 1 and 2. So if somebody tries to give you a plan of salvation from Acts 1 and 2, and you're a Gentile in Crossville, Tennessee in 2023, they're taking something out of context. And bless their heart, I realize that some of them are sincere, but that's, that's not what's being talked about. Paul gives the revelation of the church, like we have church today, in later books. But in, in, the, in the book of Acts, it's a, it's a different thing. It's completely a different thing. Let's see, what other verses do we need to look at here dealing with these things? Uh, look over at Luke chapter 3. For the remission of sins. Didn't, didn't Peter just say repent and be baptized for the remission of sins? You see the similarity? Peter's and John's baptism is almost the same. Uh, very similar uh, to Israel and, and, and in many ways. I'll talk here in just a minute about the one thing that's different. Verse 8, bring, therefore, bring forth therefore fruits worthy of repentance, and begin not to say within yourselves, We have Abraham to our father. For I say unto you that God is able of these stones to raise up children unto Abraham. See, he's dealing with Jews. 
Now, do some proselytes get in there? Absolutely. Uh, verse 10, they ask, saying, what shall we do then? Isn't that interesting? That's the same thing the Jews ask in Acts, in Acts chapter 2 when Peter says, well, wait a minute, you've killed your Messiah. And they said, well, what are we going to do then? And when John is preaching his powerful way, they say, then what do we do? And they're very similar, very similar. And then, lo and behold, look down at verse 12. Then came also publicans to be baptized and said unto him, Master, what shall we do? Then look down at verse 14. And the soldiers likewise demanded of him, saying, And what shall we do? So there were some non-Jews that got in on this. And you know what? I'm happy for Jews to get in on our Gentile church day blessings. Amen. So it's not absolutely 100% exclusive. No, but primarily he's going to Israel, talking about bringing in their kingdom. And when somebody heard the power of God in the teaching and preaching of the Bible, other people were drawn to it. People notice when the word of God is being taught and preached. Amen. It makes a difference. Amen. That's why those soldiers were drawn to it, even though it wasn't technically exactly uh, straight to them. All right, now let's talk about the, the slight difference between John's baptism and Peter's baptism. A big thing has happened in between John's baptism and Peter's baptism. What is that big thing? Jesus had a three and a half year ministry and died on the cross. Amen. And what did he say he was going to send back here when he went up? We go? My therapist, <laughs> the comforter, the Holy Spirit of God. There's my therapist. That's who I see. When I need some help, when I need some comfort, when I need to talk through my problems, I go to the Spirit of God, capital C, Comforter. That's who he sent back. Acts chapter 1, verse 5. Look at the wording here. For John truly baptized with water. See, referring to John's baptism. But ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. So it was very similar. It was to the Jews. It was bringing in the kingdom. But with the added element that Jesus has been crucified, gone up to glory, sitting on the right hand of the Father, making intercession for us, and the Holy Spirit has been sent down. And while he was still dealing with the Jews in the early part of the book of Acts, what's he doing? Signs and wonders. People healing and speaking in tongues and all that stuff because the Jews seek after a sign. But halfway through the book of Acts, the Jews reject him yet again. And Paul says, all right, I'm done with you. I'm going to the Gentiles. And those sign gifts went away. That's correct. Amen. If those sign gifts are still here and you're letting anybody be in the hospital, shame on you. You ought to go heal them. Amen. If those sign gifts are still here and you're not going to foreign speaking countries and preaching them the gospel using your gift of tongues, shame on you. You ought to be a doing that. But they're gone. There was a reason Paul said, I'm so glad I've got Luke, the beloved physician, with me. Well, why? Just get healed, man. <laughs> well, the problem is those things came to him. Stop. Whether there be tongues, it shall be taken away. All right, that's the Jewish baptism. The baptism unto Moses in the Old Testament. John's baptism to manifest Christ to Israel. And Peter's baptism while they were still trying to bring in their kingdom. And just to deal with the book of Acts, because it does cause so much contention and, and dispute, let's talk just briefly about the three questions in the book of Acts. The first one we've already read in Acts chapter 2, uh, verse 37. Now, when they heard this about them rejecting their Messiah, uh, they were pricked in their heart and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? They weren't saying, what shall we do to so we can live in heaven forever. That was not the question. To try to force that answer to this question will not match because that's not what anybody's asking. They're asking, oh no, we wanted to bring in this kingdom. This was our Messiah that was going to bring in this kingdom and we've rejected him. Now what do we do about our kingdom? That's the context. That's what's being talked about. So you don't give this as a plan of salvation because that's not, that's not only not the right answer, that's not even the right question. However, we do have somebody asking that question in the book of Acts. Look at Acts chapter 16 and see the answer given there. 
Acts chapter 16. Acts chapter 16 and verse 30. The Philippian jailer has Paul and Silas in jail, and he brings them out. And watch his question. Acts 16, verse 30. And brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? All right. Now, I know that question. Amen. That's a great one. Verse 31. And they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved in thy house. Amen. Now, when the question is, what do we do about our kingdom? All right, you Jews, be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. If the question is, what do I do to be saved and live in heaven forever? It's, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Amen. All right, now there's one other question in the book of Acts. Look at Acts chapter 9. Acts chapter 9 and verse 1. This is right when Saul, who later becomes Paul, is saved. Acts chapter 9, verse 6. And he, trembling and astonished, said, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? And the Lord said unto him, Arise and go into the city, and it shall be told thee what thou must do. So when he first got saved, he's already calling him Lord. He is now converted. You know what he says? What do you want me to do? Are you here today and you're saved? Amen. Let me tell you the question you need to be asking the Lord. What do you want me to do? Amen. Amen. Now, I'm not saying that you have to take on four or six or eight or ten or twelve ministries. But there is something you can do. Yes. You can write a check and support a missionary that's preaching the gospel in a foreign land. Yes. You can hand out a gospel track. You can say a prayer for somebody. You can tell somebody you love them and you care about them. And over there at our church, we're praying for you. And we're concerned about you. You can do something. You can bake them cookies. You can mow their yard. You can do something. And the, thing, the real good question, if you trusted the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior, is, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? And now, as he does there with Saul, who would become Paul, he doesn't always tell you right then. I wish he would. <laughs> I wish I had that instantaneous answer, and he doesn't always do it that way. But you know what? You just stick around and show the Lord that you're willing to wait on him. Wait, and he will open the door of ministry for you, I'm sure. All right, so that's Jewish baptism. Now let's look at Jesus' baptism, and we'll probably just end up having to do Gentile and the other baptism, the horrible one, uh, tonight. I don't know. All right, let's look at Jesus' baptism. Turn in your Bible to Mark chapter 10. Mark chapter 10, verse 36. Well, let's get 35 since that's the beginning of the paragraph in your Cambridge edition of the King James Bible, if that's what you have. Mark 10, verse 35. And James and John, the sons of Zebedee, come unto him, saying, Master, we would that thou shouldest do for us whatsoever we shall desire. <laughs> I prayed that way a few times. It didn't do any good. Uh, or, or just give me whatever I want. Well, sometimes we ask amiss that we may consume it on our lust, don't we? Amen. Verse 36, And he said unto them, What would ye that I should do for you? They said unto him, Grant unto us that we may sit, one on thy right hand and the other on thy left hand, in thy glory. But Jesus said unto them, Ye know not what ye ask. Can ye drink of the cup that I drink of and be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? And they said unto him, We can. And Jesus said unto them, Ye shall indeed drink of the cup that I drink of, and with the baptism that I am baptized with all shall ye be baptized. But to sit on my right hand and on my left hand is not mine to give, but it shall be given to them for whom it is prepared. And when the ten heard it, they began to be much displeased with James and John. <laughs> they said, Oh now, Lord, we're two brothers, and we love each other, and we love you, so just... Put one of us on your right and one of us on your left. We want to be the most exalted disciples. I remember when the Lord's trying to talk to him about what he was about to do and how he was going to pay such a terrible price and go through such suffering. It said they got in a fight discussing which one of them was greatest. Boy, isn't that a bunch of bad news for you? <laughs> Everybody thinks they're the greatest and they're the ones that should sit right by Jesus. <laughs> We've got, you know what? Let me tell you something. 
that's not just Baptist, I assure you. You know what the problem is? If you read and study your Bible, you will get real clear on what the trouble is in this world. Amen. It's the humans. Amen. <laughs> it's not just the men, and it's not just the women, and it's not just the blacks, and it's not just the whites, and it's not just the old, and it's not just the young, and it's not just the rich, and it's not just the poor. It's the humans. But the humans that I deal a lot with are the Baptists, so I see a lot of humanity in us, don't I? <laughs> but anyway, uh, Jesus' baptism is a baptism that is done by God the Father. And the one that gets baptized is Jesus. And he gets baptized in sin, in wrath, in death, in hell. And he took that baptism for you. All right, I'll say a few things about the uh, baptism of the Lord Jesus. All right, the first one, now, of course, we talked about John's baptism already. I'm not talking about when John baptized Jesus, because I covered that back when I covered John's baptism. Jesus did take part in John's baptism. But as to what Jesus was baptized or dipped into, for me and you, doesn't have, doesn't have much to do with water after the one that he had with John. It was a baptism of suffering. And first of all, he was holy and sinless. And he who knew no sin became sin for us. He was dipped or baptized down into mine and your sins. He bore our sins Amen. in his body on the tree. Amen. For somebody that's holy, let me tell you something, that is not a fun thing. Amen. Now you and I don't fully understand that. We can academically know that Jesus was holy and he took on all our sins. But we don't feel anything when we just know that in our brains. But when somebody is holy and they're baptized into filth, that is a gross thing. That was not a pleasant thing for him to go through. Now me and you, we sin. Every one of us has lied. Every one of us has cheated. Every one of us has thought some bad thoughts and done some bad things. So we're, we, we can't really feel what a 100% holy person went through being baptized or dipped into our sins. Can we? Well, let me tell you something. It was no fun. I'll tell you something else about it. It was a baptism of suffering of anticipation. You remember when you were in trouble? And your mama said, all right, go up to your room and wait till your daddy gets home. And I tell him what you're doing. <laughs> all right, now that is some suffering of anticipation. Amen. I was in a real strict Christian school. And every now and then I heard that the prisoner... <laughs> the principal, the principal, he probably felt like a prisoner sometimes with some of those kids. The principal had heard about something I had done, and he was wanting to see me in his office. And I remember ticking off in my head and trying to figure out which one he must have found. <laughs> and I had a suffering of anticipation. Have you ever had something that you knew you had to do and you dreaded it? And it was in the back of your mind. There was that lump in your throat, and there was that knot in your stomach as you thought all day about what you was going to have to do later that day. Uh, anticipation is no fun when you know it's something bad you've got to look forward to. Luke 12, verse 50, Jesus says this. He says, but I have a baptism to be baptized with, and how am I straightened till it be accomplished? His looking forward to that and knowing that was what was going to happen was really getting to it. He had uh, anticipation there about some things. There's a reason he was a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. If you knew you had to go through what he knew he had to go through, no wonder he didn't go around just laughing and joking all the time. Uh, that would affect you. Not to mention the broken fellowship with the Father and the things he would have to go through. Uh, not only was it a suffering of anticipation, it was a suffering of loneliness. He had to just go get alone even from the disciples and pray on the mountains sometimes. Because there were some things they just couldn't understand and they just couldn't go through with him and they just weren't ready to know yet. He said, I have a baptism to be baptized with and how am I straightened, limited? There's only certain people that will even know a little bit of this and there's only me and the Father to go through some of it. And some of it got so bad... He had, the Father sent angels down to minister to him when he was so weak from going through it. Amen. He got so concerned about it that he sweat great drops of blood. So Jesus' baptism was not a, not a, a 
positive one at all. Psalm 69, he says, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And of course, that's what he quotes there on the cross. It says about the disciples, it says, They all forsook him and fled. I'll tell you something else. It was a suffering of death and hell. Look at Acts chapter 2. He died and was baptized into the ground, wasn't he? He was buried. Acts chapter 2, verse 23. Him being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God, ye have taken him and by wicked hands have crucified and slain, whom God hath raised up, having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible that he should be holden of it. For David speaketh concerning him. I foresaw the Lord always before my face, for he is on my right hand, that I should not be moved. Therefore did my heart rejoice, and my tongue was glad. Moreover also my flesh shall rest in hope. Because thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. Amen. Mm -hmm. His soul was in hell. Amen. We know some other things that he went through. He preached to the spirits in prison. We know our sins had to get taken care of somehow. So he went down there. So Jesus' baptism was a suffering of anticipation. It was a suffering of loneliness. It was a suffering of death and hell. Down in verse uh, 31, he, in Acts chapter 2, he mentions it again when he says, He seeing this before spake of the resurrection of Christ, that his soul was not left in hell, neither his flesh did see corruption. Amen. He says it twice just in case you missed it. He wants you to know what Jesus went through for you. Paul tells us in Romans chapter 6. Romans chapter 6. God forbid, how shall we that are dead to sin, verse 2, live any longer therein? Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? Therefore, we are buried with him by baptism into death. Not into water. Into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. Now, water baptism is a good type of that. It's a good picture of that. And when I get to Gentile baptism, we'll talk about that. But there is a sense in which the Lord, after you get saved, lets you go through some suffering. Amen. You say, now why in the world would I get in a Christian life where you're telling me I'm going to go through suffering? Let me tell you why. Because it's a whole lot better suffering than what you go through if the devil is your master. Amen. The way of the transgressor is hard. Amen. And don't get me wrong. I know. I know our Baptist history. I know about Obadiah Holmes being beat in Weatherford over there in prison. And people about starving to death out trying to preach the gospel and terrible persecutions and these things. I know about it. But let me tell you something. I'd rather go through that than the Lord Jesus with me go through what this poor world has to go through and know God. I can tell you by experience, when I've gone through Mr. Hard Times and I had Jesus right by my side, it wasn't near for me what it is for others. Folks, put Jesus by your side. Amen. Amen. It is not near the same thing. I've never been tempted in my worst trials of my life, and I've had a few, or not. They're not much to brag on com compared to some of my Baptist forefathers, but I've had some, a lot worse than I thought I could have ever stood. I've never needed a drug to alleviate my emotional suffering. I've never needed a drink to alleviate my emotional suffering. I've never had to talk to somebody other than somebody that loves the Lord Jesus about my problems. You know why? Because i got Jesus right there with me. Amen. God forbid I didn't have any friends or church members to talk to. And don't get me wrong, you are precious to me. I'd hate to think about that. But if I did find myself in that place, as long as I had the Lord Jesus and the Holy Spirit of God to come to her, I have what I need. I really do. I found that out. And I, I didn't always know that in the same sense that I know it now. So that's the Jewish baptism, and that's the baptism of our Lord Jesus. And in a watered-down sense, 
you and I as Christians can go through a similar baptism of some suffering. It's not the same. Don't misunderstand. I wouldn't put it anywhere near his intensity, but it ain't exactly fun to go through, is it? You've had your heart broken by a loved one. If you've been through some difficulties serving the Lord, you know it ain't fun. It's not near what you thought it was going to be. What in the world did those Hebrew children think getting thrown in that fiery furnace? But when they got in there and the form of the fourth in there with them was Jesus, the smell of smoke wasn't even on. That's right. Oh, live for the Lord Jesus. And you'll experience similar things. Amen. All right, it's about 12 o'clock noon, and uh, I've done.